Welcome to The Passion Pod with your host, Chris Johnson. Thanks for joining us. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the feature presentation. Welcome back, friends. Today we drove 1,200 miles. Well, it was like 1,212 miles, I think. That was over the last two days. Drove all the way to Austin, Texas to meet up with an artist that I met in a club in LA (laughs) (laughs) quite a while ago. He handed me a sticker. I was like, dope, I'm really into this, I like this. So we became Instagram buddies, kind of went back and forth chatting, and I wanted to go somewhere warm. So I drove all the way here, almost didn't have this interview happen, but it did last second, so thank you so much for having me. (laughs) Welcome to the show, Eric Ross. I appreciate that, man, I'm stoked. It's kind of crazy to to understand where we did meet, and then the setting we met, and everything that happened, and especially because why I was there in the first place was pretty random, but hanging out with Isaac and those guys was just wild. Like that whole experience was kind of a trip. So have have you been to LA a bunch of times? No, that was my first time. Um, Ironically, my buddy, Matt true that a Trujillo that was with me at the time. If you remember him, um, we were actually in New York the weekend before he had a show at Wells Chelsea in Manhattan or it is Wells Chelsea. I guess the town is called, but at the gallery there. And I happened to show, you know, and that I can't even remember what show it was, to be honest. I put my nose in it and I actually got selected to be a part of it. And yeah, we, Matt decided just to fly out there with me. And we knew Pietro, um, who yeah. introduced me to Isaac. They were just hanging out and it was kind of a trip. Like I was actually just kind of hanging out, waiting to get in our Airbnb. And both of them were just hanging out with us, you know, just talking shit before we got into our space. It was literally sitting in an alley, just hanging out, eating a sandwich and just like, just burning three hours before we could get in. Yeah. And uh, it was kind of trippy. We all just were laughing, cutting it up, and then they just invited us to kind of hang out with them throughout the weekend. And it was kind of trippy because Isaac, you know, I followed him on Instagram, and the whole time I'm talking to him, it didn't even register. Like, it was very... I don't don't even know how to explain it. Like, it was just trippy because we were all just, like, hitting it off, and then I was like, man, I really like this cat. And then somehow I look at his Instagram, and I'm like, oh, dude, I already... Oh, like you didn't realize it was him. I had no idea. Oh, I'm like, I know your art. And I was like, I knew that. But like, you know, they had left. And I'm like, man, I I really, you know, like those cats. They're fun. Like there's normal, you know, normal guys that I was talking to as if I've known them for years. And then, yeah, little did I know the guy, it's a guy that I've looked, you know, followed and watched, you know, do his work. So it was kind of crazy how like serendipitous like all that was yeah he's uh, he's incredible and the fact he's only 25 is like mind-blowing super humble and yeah. the, one of the coolest i mean it's just cool to see like it just inspires me so much like to run into you meet him meet Pietro too for the first time even though i know he's kind of has similar friends here but like everybody was just so cool so open so normal and just you know there was nothing they were trying to prove or i don't know it was just like one of the best experiences and like it was just cool, like a shit. Yeah, to like, totally. Because I felt very uncomfortable in LA. Oh, sure. Very yeah, much. it's kind of a, it's a very different atmosphere for sure. It's I think part of it is because it's so ridiculous expensive out there that a lot of people that live out there are very much on a mission, you know, to prove something or to accomplish something or whatever, and their eyes are so fixated on the goal right. that it can be really intense to be around. At least that's how I've experienced it. So when right. I go, it's like. I go for a week, interview a bunch of really cool people, and dip back out to Wisconsin. Right. Although coming here, like I, I could, I understand why people live in Austin. This place, I mean, I've only been here for the day so far, but it's been really dope. But anyways, let's get back earlier though. So you said you, to me off mic earlier, you were a transplant. Where are you actually from? Yeah, I'm originally from McKinney, Texas, which is north of Dallas, about a half hour, like directly, directly north. Um, that's where I grew up. Was born, raised there, as where my parents were. So. We've been in that area for a very long time. Um, and then I spent some time up in Oklahoma, went to OU to play baseball, got a scholarship to play for the Sooners, and then spent some time in Oklahoma City, and then, yeah, found my way back to Austin. What happened to the baseball career? Um, it was a good career, man. I mean, I played one year in high school. You know, we crushed it, flew into the state tournament, which is neat. I love bragging about that stuff still. Uh, played one year of junior college. Um, there was position? A, I was a center fielder or oh, cool. outfield, yeah. leadoff hitter type guy. And uh, yeah, there's a really good junior college um, right on the border between Oklahoma and Texas called Grayson County. And it's a, a place where a good stepping stone for a lot of guys that don't get really a lot of looks or, you know, have other reasons to go to a, a school like that. But we ended up winning a World Series there and 
after that year, I got recruited to go to A and M, OU, TCU. You know, a lot. I got to take my pick, so it was pretty cool. And then OU ended up being the school and played in the College World Series with OU as well. It was pretty crazy. Um, but yeah, towards the end of it, I mean, I just kind of recognized, you know, also like where my passion was with it at that point, and also my size and who I am. Like you can find me. That's you know, they're all six four. I mean, you can basically find talent around like all the way around the country up and down like I, yeah. I just knew i wouldn't really be make an impact at that level and it was kind of like reading the writing on the wall and at the same time understanding like i was kind of ready to to move past that because it consumed everything that i had ever done yeah. for years you know well, like, to get to that point like the play at that kind of level yeah it has to i mean it consumed everything so yeah it was kind of cool and it was like kind of natural to break away from it um i ended up telling my athletic director and our director of operations, Ryan Gaines and uh, Greg Tipton, those two guys really took care of me and looked after me there. And um, yeah, I just mentioned to them that I wanted to maybe pursue grad school because I was like, you know, what the fuck is two more years um, in the grand scheme of things when honestly I, my identity was stripped from me. Yeah. You know, you look at yourself and you're no longer a, a baseball player, an athlete. You're just, you know, another person, you know, which is fine. But at the same time for myself, it was like, who am I? What do I want? It was like all of this, like a rebirth almost. And it took me about my entirety of grad school to kind of find myself again. And even then I was still struggling. Yeah, identity it. crisis is a thing a lot of people struggle with. I'm really impressed whenever I see anybody that is doing really well in any kind of field and chooses to walk away or forced to either way, but walks away from it and then finds something else and is able to put 100% of themselves into it. Right. There's been a lot of people that have done that. Look at like Jason Lee, you know, would be like an example. Mm -hmm. He was a a top pro skateboarder. He was extremely famous in the skateboarding world. He was top five, probably most famous at the time. And while he was still pro and really well known, was like, I just really like acting, you know? And then <laughs> did the Mars movies or whatever. Right. He did, he, and then got that gig as, you know, my name is Earl. He's the mm -hmm. one who played Earl and my name yeah. is Earl. And became a, you know, A-list type actor, which I'm sure at the time, there was at least some identity crisis of like, well, but I'm a pro skateboarder. This is what everyone expects me to be. This is what people mm -hmm. want me to be. Yeah. How do I accept that with myself that I don't want to do this forever, that I actually want to go in a different direction, allow <laughs> myself to do that and then pour myself into it. Yeah. It's wild. I mean, you're just basically committing to having the same conversation a thousand times Yeah. because people assume that you're still doing even decades later. I have people going like, you're not playing baseball anymore. I'm like, buddy, I'm 34 now. Like yeah. last time I played baseball was, 2012 like sure. that has not even even in the same realm of being like yeah like what <laughs> you know like yeah. it's like even now like even with them seeing what i've been doing or maybe not but like they still assume like yeah what of course was they then. associate what they knew of yeah, you especially exactly. at the time if they haven't been friends since or whatever they associate it's been that way with me with my skateboard shop too right it's you know when i tell people i have a podcast years later you know i've been doing this a long time they still say Oh, cool. About skateboarding? I'm like, well, no, that's not like the only thing that ever runs through my mind, <laughs> right. surprisingly. I can, right. My skate shop turns nine uh, in April. So it's Dude, been a long awesome. time. Congrats yeah, on that. Thank you. That's badass, actually. And it's, it's dope. It's become a really cool part of the community, and I love everything about it. Um, and I still skate and stuff, but like I eventually there was like some other things that I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, who's your favorite baseball player? Just curious. Baseball player? Man, I have a few. Um, Cause I got to figure out who I need to slide into the DMS and be like, look, I need to do this interview. Cause Eric's a big fan. I'll get you on. I mean, he's an, he's an old school cat. Um, Juan Gonzalez is, a is an old Texas Ranger 96 MVP. He's just a, a dude. Um, he's one of my favorites, but aside from that, I had to go Ichiro Suzuki and Vladimir Guerrero are my two outside of the Rangers. I'm a Rangers fan. I grew up in the sure. area. So it's like, but Juan Gonzalez, definitely one of my favorites, but, um, outside of that yeah each row and vlad which is trippy i mean to think about but Wong Gonzalez was a dude especially growing up like he was just a guy that i just i mean yeah i just thought he was incredible it's funny because in now in today's world really you can just like dm people and get a hold of a lot of people that way oh yeah I i've mean, had a lot of people like I, I interviewed a packers player and i'm from wisconsin mm -hmm. so like green bay packers is everything you know we don't brewers aren't we never win you know and if we do get good for a season our players get bought up and that's a whole different conversation yeah but packers is like that everyone's super into that right mm -hmm. and then i was just sitting one day let me gloat in my hot tub because it's dope yeah, <laughs> but i was just sitting that. there <laughs> and i was like i wonder if i can get a hold of a packers player i feel like the show's gotten big enough and so i just dm'd a dozen of them or whatever and then yeah. one of them hit me back and he's like sure 
It's like sick. Why so not? I got to go over to Lambeau Field and do the whole thing, oh, interview cool. him and get a jersey. And it was a whole oh, thing. But me cool. as like the little kid inside of me was like, damn, this is so sick. Yeah. You know, because I was such a huge fan growing up. I got a Packers tattoo right there. Oh, that's cool. I mean, it's just cool to know that like more than what you, we know is within reach. It's yeah. just like a matter of just putting yourself out there. Yeah. I DM Jermichael Finley. He was a, a Pro Bowl tight end for the Packers Dope. from Texas. Um, and I follow him on Instagram. And unfortunately, he's in the Lido. That's what he told me. Yeah, okay. same thing. He actually hit me back, which was so sick because right. he was before social media. He was massive. Yeah. Otherwise, his social media numbers would be insane. And that's a different story. So, getting to art, when did you start doing art? Were you doing? I gotta imagine you were, you know, into art as a kid too, right? Yeah, I drew on everything. I mean, any class paperwork, any. I mean, doodling is kind of like my the thing that's been a part of my life forever. Um, I, I kind of grew up, you know, just like everybody else, drawing my favorite cartoons, you know, like doing which all were, of that ones? stuff. I mean, I loved um, just the classic, man, Bugs Bunny, um, Marvin the Martian, like Looney Tunes, basically. Yeah, it was okay. like my, that was my bread and butter. Yeah, we're like the same age, so that's yeah, why I was curious. Yeah, yeah. Looney Tunes was my, my joint, uh, for sure. Did you ever get a chance to go to Six Flags? Oh, yeah, yeah, we did that growing up. Uh, I hadn't been in years. Uh, yeah, I just, I went through pictures of my, my house. I ended up selling my first house, bought the house I grew up in. Work. So I got a whole bunch of stuff my dad kept from forever. And I found a box and I found a picture of me at Six Flags with uh, yeah. Taz. That's cool. When I was See, a little kid, dope. he was, I was, I was so stoked yeah. to meet the person who was in the costume of that. <laughs> I'd be curious to go back because I'm sure it's like, just to have a day there at this age is like $250. Mm. I feel like everything would be insane. But yeah, I mean, Cartoons were, were my thing, but as I got older, you know, like I, I liked making people feel uncomfortable with my art. Like, I guess it was before the Instagram, you know, obviously anything online age. So like in the graph scene in my in my town in the suburbs wasn't crazy. You just saw shitty, uh, you know, hand styles. Nothing that was like groundbreaking. Right. Um, and then I went to the mall one day, man, and like at that point I was still drawing and doing my own thing with it with whatever that meant at that point just but, like high school age or yeah what? Okay. pretty much and then i saw a guy that I actually i'm friends with today uh jason etherly um he actually he's done you'll see the piece up when you kind of take a tour of the place later that at the top and on the top left there he's just been a, a super big influence in my in my art career too because he's the first one that i saw because this you know this little gallery in the mall was like you know all florals and landscapes and then all of a sudden there's this like Queen Elizabeth with a gas mask and I'm just like what is this you know like right. and that right there is what made me like enjoy art it's like I want to make you question what you're looking at and that was kind of my fav favorite thing to do as a kid like take something normal and then make it weird enough to for you to be like what are you thinking like, what's the first thing you can remember making with that intent with that intent it was like these guys um holding each other it was like a two couple and <laughs> that guy's holding each other that sounded crazy um basically this this duo of characters where one guy had a box on his head um kind of similar to like the the brown bag at like yeah. a football game or sure. something that's kind of like the approach and the other guy had just an eyeball head and it was kind of like one showing him like to you know be more open-minded again especially at oh, that sure. time i was questioning everything you know yeah. that was a part of my life that i was like what is religion what is you know why are you like telling me to do this like why do i have to live life in a certain perspective that you see, deem fit. And if, like, I was just in that phase where I was really challenging all of my friends, everybody I knew. And I mean, obviously I grew out of that. I realized that's just like not the right thing to do. But in those age, you know, that age, I was just like pushing my limit for who I was and just trying to figure out what made sense, you know, like, yeah. but also meeting a lot of stuff with resistance, even my closest friends. I was just like, why do you believe that for yeah. what? Well, and it's such a contradictory space to be in sports. Yeah. You know, especially at like high school and stuff being For sure. the stud on the field, being really, really into it. <laughs> yeah. But the people that are really into that typically, you know, follow follow the rules a little bit more. Oh yeah. I was pushing the boundaries. I was still I was smoking weed. I was you know, you know, I was doing everything, you know, not within the means. Like that structure saved my life. Like baseball is what gave me the structure I needed in those in that age, even through college to help teach me a lot like sure. I owe baseball a lot because I think I mean in grad school just like cut to that real quick like when I woke up and all I had to do was go to class and go home I was I, what yeah like that yeah. this is what everybody's been doing like all you have to do is worry about going to this one class and going home and then that's that's their day I was like or two classes whatever you want to put there yeah I was just like I didn't know what to do with myself 
Sure. Because that I, when I, art really took over then? Yeah, because that, that was, art was starting to take one. I, I uh, had a really good friend of mine who moved in with me in grad school who was lost too. Um, his um, was to be wife, you know, got engaged. She broke it off. He was kind of in, in the interim of like finding his work, like stepping out into the real world at that time. And he's like, I'm just going to come post up in Norman with you for a year and just kind of figure out what I need to do. And at that time he, he was kind of pushing me be like, dude, you're good at this. Like keep feeding it. And for myself, it was a therapeutic outlet. I realized that that was my place to kind of get away from like the identity crisis and yeah. like understanding where I wanted to go. It was just kind of like where I found peace in, in, in that sense. So from there is kind of where I kind of gained some confidence. And then he signed me up for an art show. I had no idea about, I got it. And then I had to produce like 15 works for this little show, you know, yeah. nothing crazy, like a, a art crawl yeah, with okay. beer and stuff, you know, yeah. it was at a place called Bigfoot Creative in Norman, Oklahoma. And <clears throat> I did some pieces and it kind of gave me some, you know, momentum because people were like, yeah, I'll buy that for 50 bucks or, yeah. you know, kind of just like sparked this interest in me. And then, yeah, it kind of just snowballed from there, you know, like I just started feeding it more, playing with different mediums, yeah. and pushing my boundaries with my characters and yeah kind of that's where the ball kind of got pushed yeah. yeah it's exciting when you create just because you want to create oh, and yeah. then it starts to work out without you intending it to work out for sure i think that's such a better route for your mental health mm -hmm. to do be able to do it that way and i hope more artists can get into a space where they can exclusively do it that way right. rather than having all their stuff dictated by what somebody else wants obviously a lot of artists in order to pay their bills have to take different commissions that do oh, you know yeah. what i mean that give all these different stringent whatever and hopefully they can find a way to still have their voice within that that's obviously not always the case but when people can just do the art that they like doing just because they like doing it and then it pays off oh yeah it's like man, man that's this is the such dream a gift it's yeah. the duality right yeah it's, absolutely it's give and take i mean and it never goes away sadly yeah, yeah. what i one thing i want to do is get all of the guests to send me longer lists like 10 or 12 song playlists oh. and then put those out you oh, know okay, through cool. social media or whatever yeah. i think because when you listen to somebody's music selections i feel like you really get a cool feel like a different kind of feel for the person oh, than for sure. anything else especially you know like I mean? a studio playlist or something something yeah. to understand like kind of in what environment they create their art in it's always neat yeah which is kind of what i'm saying and what i'm talking about now like these songs that i'll be throwing out are basically songs that i I tap into on them dope well we're yeah. gonna get on a, i'll get you to give me a longer playlist then um is this your you're, you're at paintings that aren't finished right there. Do you paint a lot in your place or do you have a separate studio that you paint in? Yeah, so that's that's the tricky part about the city. Um, the city's so damn expensive that having a true studio space is very difficult to have. Uh, luckily, my buddy uh, Jeff Skelly, or Jeff Sheely is his actual name. Jeff Skelly is, uh, Skelly is his art name, so I, I just call him Jeff Skelly. It makes yeah. it easy, but he's got a spot here in South Austin where it's just a normal apartment complex, but he has two garages that are a hundred dollars a piece yeah. that he can paint out of and that you know they have no issue so he lets me use his studio especially right now because i'm you know getting building up for my first solo show um basically i have like a, a system to where i go to his studio spray paint the majority and i take it back here for the brush and detail side so like yeah. you can see some of that stuff where it's like all the detail work is handled here indoors but um smaller pieces yeah i can definitely paint here but it's like a lot of going in and out on my balconies and stuff so it's yeah. not the ideal situation but yeah sometimes i'll spray paint in here i mean it's uh not the best for this yeah place, i just but, <laughs> i set up uh, in my basement an eight foot by eight foot cinder block mm, wall i have that i'm lot. just like this is going to be just for spray paint like playing around with because i'm garbage with, with spray right. paint the only thing i was ever arrested for growing up was graffiti really i used to cut stencils and oh, spray okay, paint right and stuff on. but i only ever cut stencils right you know so spray painting you can't mess that up really that easily it's right? difficult yeah i mean i don't know yeah but to different. use can't like well, it depends on what you're doing with it. But, but I mean, to really use cans the way that they can be used, I, I don't know anything about uh, it. All I'm my still, paintings are brush. I'm still very, very young in that game, I think. I mean, I have definitely have some can control, and my fades are kind of my best of my techniques in, uh, in spray paint. But in terms of, I'm not a graffiti writer or anything like that. Didn't grow up doing it. I picked up spray paint in 2012, and since then I've kind of 
taken the medium and then applied it to the techniques that I enjoy using and kind of developed my own voice in that, in that way. I was just in Puerto Rico and this graffiti artist, he was from New York and he was whatever, some old school, he was like 50 or something, had been graffiti writing since forever. Mm -hmm. And it was really funny because I was given this wall at this, this, it's this cool like ruins kind of spot where it's like a curated outdoor gallery, cool. right? And so I, I noticed this art of an artist friend of mine in New York who does these like robots. I saw it, DM'd him like, yo, I just saw your stuff in the wild. This place is so cool. And he's like, oh, this is my other buddy. He's the curator for that spot. Sweet. Contacted him. And we were there long enough, thankfully, that he's like, yo, your guys' work is dope. Let me get a wall for you. Cool. So he set up two separate walls, one for me, one for my friend Jay that I was out there with. So we both got to paint, right? Oh, that's awesome. But so I'm painting my wall and I'm doing all brush stuff because that's what I do really. And uh, I got this old school graffiti writer, a couple, I don't know, 40 feet away painting. And he comes up and he's talking so much shit to me yeah. about how street art is whack and all yep. this other stuff. And oh, I'm yeah. like, my Graffiti dude. writers don't, yeah, they don't play. They don't. Ruthless. Yeah. But it was it, by the end of like the day of painting the mm -hmm. whole day, him and his other like old school graffiti friend came out. They kept like kind of peeking over. And eventually by the end, they're like, man, you can get really clean lines like that. I really like what you're doing. It's like, yeah. thanks. Yeah. And then, but at the end, he specifically, the reason I'm telling the story is he said, I like what you're doing, but don't you ever spray paint and then use a brush to clean your edges. <laughs> <That's hilarious. laughs> yeah. I mean, they, they definitely have their own Bible of yeah. how they need to go about it, especially on murals like that. Um, but primarily my, you know, I, I feel that the same, but to get what I want and the look and the aesthetic I want to achieve on my canvas work, it's impossible. I don't, I just don't see a reason why there has to be a harsh rule. It's such a funny thing that like graffiti and that whole, it's anti-establishment, it's anti-rules. Why are there rules to something that I mean, there's the game, the having... game within the game. Yeah, yeah it's... it's dope though. I respect it. I, I love the etiquette and I like when, the more I've learned about you know, that entire culture, like over the years and, you know, having friends that are in that space yeah. and just kind of understanding like the perspectives and what totally. it is and why it is. And it's neat, you know, and, uh, cause I'm not really a street artist or a muralist for that matter. And the company that I've been working with and, um, they definitely sell, you know, commercial work that, you know, helps curate and manage like artists and artworks and stuff like that. So I've definitely painted on a ton of different mural jobs, but majority of my artwork is on canvas like that's where i make right. my money and uh, in that space and that's what i like to do so like i guess it's like weird because like people are like yeah he's a graffiti artist i'm like just because i use spray paint doesn't make me right. a graffiti artist and like all like they just everybody from a high level assume that if you use a can it's all the same stuff so yeah. it's like interesting to kind of understand like the different tranches of like how things kind of get dialed yeah like automatically totally you get put in a category based on like just the perception of yeah everything. totally and they and they, i i got what they were saying and it was cool because we were all cool by the end of the day but you know of where street art it's like all these street art opportunities came about because of graffiti and mm -hmm. and everything and i'm like dude yeah i used to spray graffiti so like I, sure. I totally understand what you're talking about um but there, there's just like different spaces you know and and that's why i was kind of explaining to him like i'm a, i'm i'm a city official where i live like i have a code of conduct and stuff oh yeah I, can't be arrested for, for sure. anything so i don't i'm not a graffiti artist because i don't do any graffiti at all i'm not trying to run from that right i'm like i don't i don't do any of that the <laughs> walls that i've painted are have all been legal so right. you're right i'm not a graffiti artist and i'm not trying to be i love what you guys are doing but that isn't what i'm doing you know and and so i guess what i was getting at was like it's really i think limiting what how you use different tools mm -hmm. is really just like holding you back I think when you can find when you can find a way to use the tools available to you and you can get creative with those tools to create something new, that's where all the progression and oh, all the sure. excitement comes from. I mean, that's that's I think that's where artists learn how to make their own voice. If they get all the tools and all the resources, sometimes they could do something great with it. But I think having the lack of resources is what pushes that creativity. Yeah. You know, so how did you find your voice? Oh, I mean, my characters and basically I start with doodles and I started doing these, this weird looking dude, um, that I don't think I have a sticker of it anywhere, but he's kind of, he was kind of the centerpiece of like my artwork. And I don't know if you've seen the red cutout that was on my Instagram from a while. I'm back. sure I did. Just this plain Jane face with a mustache. It's like very just front strike straight on. Um, but yeah, I just was drawing these characters and I love drawing like weird, you know, just characters from like the cartoon 
background i guess yeah. that kind of developed and then from there this this one character kind of like showed itself in college in a way and then from there i've kind of just been morphing and playing off of messing with those shapes and how i made that face it's kind of all transpired to kind of what you see around me so it's kind of what i like to call it is they're more like i don't know metaf- like they're portraits of myself in some way again because sure. like they're really derivative in some you know some terms never the same um but at the same time very similar and linear and in, in terms of like when you look at it and i've just been kind of dialing in my approach on what it is but just taking what i'm experiencing what i'm going through what i'm feeling at the time and this that's what i use to channel all that energy and get it out so it's like also kind of a reflection of kind of what that was in that moment sure yeah. did you what did you go to what were you getting your grad degree for <laughs> My degrees were about as basic as any other ass student. Athlete. <laughs> Something unrelated. Yeah, it was sure. terrible. Uh, my communication undergrad with a human relations grad, it was just basic. Um, it was kind of fucked up, to be honest, because um, actually, no, I'm not even going to say that. about. Actually, I will say that about the school system sometimes. Sometimes they just thought, like, I felt like I was in a business degree at one point, and then I did brutal in a class, BizCalc 2, just completely bombed it and it was like my first class i just transferred into ou and i failed it but it was like i'm in a class of 250 people for me that transfer that was a huge difference to me like that was a you know a shock also not raising my hand in a class of 250 and i'm feeling behind so the class just passed me by you know and then i failed that class and then my um i'm sure they have far better people in that field now but the um advisors our student advisors didn't really even give me options well you're gonna do this this is gonna what you're gonna do i'm like okay you know i just night i just walked out of there because i had also first generation college i have no other person to go to to talk about what they're just stoked that i'm at ou yeah getting a degree you know i pretty much not didn't get a full scholarship but i was like 60 percent like sure so like they had no advice right for me they were just stuck that i was there and the fact that those advisors like I felt like when I look back on it, I, I felt like I was taken advantage, not taken advantage of, but they were just concerned about the APR rate, like right. the athletic percentage graduation rate. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, you can do this. You'll graduate. Our numbers still look good. We're out. Yeah. Like, they, they weren't looking at what's best. Zero for you. concern yeah. about what I wanted to do after. They never asked me that question. Um, they just were like, this is what you're going to do since you couldn't perform in that. And it's like, they didn't ask why I couldn't perform in that. They didn't ask, were you dealing with something? Were the transition going okay with you, you know, coming from a college where you had 25 kids in your class? Like right. none of those questions were had. So then what happens when you graduate and you're lost because you don't want to <laughs> use that degree? What did you, what did you get a job in that field initially anyways? Nah. Or like, how did, how did it work? When did the transition, I guess, come into of you being like a full-time artist? Oh, okay. Even for myself, the, the degrees didn't mean anything to me. Um, I, I never really knew what I wanted to do, but I also didn't feel like degrees at that point kind of like today like yeah. now it's very clear that your degrees don't really mean that much to where you want to go and what do it just kind of gives them an idea of like you're committed to what you want to finish you know like it kind of gives it a different it's a different yeah. feeling that there's a, a very there's a lot of different career paths that having a degree is relative it's it's irrelevant it would be better to have like four years experience in the field right you know what i mean they're just like great you actually can commit to something yeah but that's mostly what it means right so and i understood that then and felt that then i thought sales for me like any other athlete i feel like it's pretty i just thought that skill set for sales was like where i built i didn't know where i wanted to go at that time but i knew sales was the foundation to my skill set to build on uh, with my experience you know in school and just kind of all those things i learned throughout those years and just being maturing in, in that time um so i jumped in um this job where it was property management sales software sales brutal holy shit that's where i sat down at a desk and cold called for eight hours a day and i'm coming from a, a time where i was outside for 10 hours a day yeah. you know <laughs> like yeah. think about how much i was moving my body in those years of college and you know even in grad school i was a grad assistant so i was even out there with the team like during practices didn't have to travel or anything like that but it was rad but yeah then i'm all of a sudden stuck at a computer and then i learned that i could probably 
start a cult. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just hated it so much and I questioned yeah. it so hard in, in, in real time that I think I, my friends around me all eventually left soon after me because I was like, why are we doing this? Look at what we're doing. You know, like yeah. I was that voice, you know, and I felt bad because I feel like sometimes people around me, I think, left that job because I was just like, just just yeah. crush it you know like this one i hated it but cool cool enough that my boss knew, recognized that and he's like hey man i know you're not enjoying this i'm like i'm not he's like i'll give you a month just like hit the bare minimum of what you need to do and i'll buy you a month to find another job so you don't have to like hit this transition sure. so i was like rad fast forwarding i got a job with a um a manufacturer selling blinds shades and shutters <laughs> okay yeah random i knew some guys that were the manufacturers out of my hometown and the job was back in oklahoma in Oklahoma City, and I was an outside sales rep. Nobody from the company there but me. Pretty rad. Money was great. Yeah. I would just drive around looking for commercial construction, and go in and try to bid that trade for the contract for that build. Yeah. So it was dope. I, I liked it for a time because it taught me the skill set that is lateral to any trade. Oh, absolutely. I was in sales since I was sixteen. Yeah. And I, I, it's been the people skills that you learn from it and the strategies and everything. It translates oh, yeah. extremely well. But the, even the core structure, like yeah. um, you know, we are trying to look for the architects to be the preferred vendor for the general contractor. So when they take it to the subcontractors, you're already preferred vendor when it gets to that low level, yeah. and you're already in there making the sell. But it, like, and yeah. Anyways, I did that. Then I was art started to really grow in that time. That's where I was in a basement in Oklahoma, living in downtown Oklahoma City for a few years. Loved that little city. Made zero friends, which is bizarre. Um, because you were so focused on art. Not necessarily. I think, <laughs> yeah, but I think I was kind of like still kind of broke, still trying to figure out who I was. And my, a lot of my friends that were there were like car industry, you know, just doing, they're just like, you know, I mean, I party and they'll you know, get down with some shit, but like they were just on a different level. You know, they were in the car industry. So that's like a different level of party. Um, I, they had fast money and I don't know, it was just like a scene that I wasn't really attracted to. And I kind of just recluse, you know, I was just, yeah. I knew that I, did, I wasn't going to be there long. So I, I just felt it's kind of reserved. I don't know. I felt like sure. in myself. Um, but yeah, art started to slowly rise to the top because I was starting to play with, um, did, you know, spray paint a lot more. And then I was starting to find my voice in my characters and kind of what you see, like it was the really beginning of it taking off for myself. And that was finally fed up. And then I just, um, I was Googling stuff in Austin. I had friends here. I'd come paint at Hope Outdoor Gallery here. Yeah. Kind of like similar walls, like where it's a curated walls that you can just show up and jam. Um, it was just a shit show out there, really. And it was fun because I would just come in and paint, learn how to paint a little bigger. Also find artists that I liked, followed, like Eye Doctor, that, the guy you tagged. Yeah. Like I followed him early on before I moved here. So I've known oh, him cool. before I got here. And now we're friends. Um, just kind of like followed, you know, kind of like got introduced to the scene in some way, visiting, visiting a friend. And then I found this company called Spray TX, where it's at the time, they've been here since 2013, hitting their 10 year. And they were kind of like this, you know, street art. They like kind of helped artists get into the commercial space, a little more organized than what the artists were doing. So they were kind of like finding a way to connect the larger clients with these people that are just trying to get off the ground. Right. Instagram was kind of just getting rock in in 2013 that was but by this point 2016 17 they were kind of already established been around four years and i just thought they were cool as shit yeah their online presence was dope and i'm like i'm gonna try to get a job with them and i took a stab at it swung and miss and then um ironically six months later i'm on indeed yeah. just the word having the worst time of my life looking for the next corporate job, you know, yeah. what it was, what it felt like. And then I'm looking for Austin cause I knew I wanted to move back into Texas. Um, just in not North Texas. I'm not a big fan of North Texas. Um, and yeah, um, I guess long story short, they had an opening spray TX did. And I lied, said I lived here. Um, they were looking for a sales guy. I was like, I'll, I'll sell, you know, I can sell, you know, and it's art. It's a you know, passion. I can learn that. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I drove out here on a Tuesday did the interview, drove home on a Wednesday. I uh, was back here working, living on Thursday morning. Oh God. Living wow. on my buddy's couch. Wow. Yeah. And then I just lived out of a duffel bag off his couch for a month or two. So I can just like get in the system with them and like know that I was ready to start and jump on it. So I didn't miss it. And um, 
yeah, and then I slowly kind of weeded out the other sales reps and then completely controlled the uh, contracts because it's the same structure. We go out for general contract, like the same thing with yeah. the GC subcontract. We are essentially a general contractor right. helping subcontract out, you know, hiring artists to execute certain things or we do it in house, like all the same approach, yeah. different um, pieces to that game. But yeah, I got basically put into a vacuum to learn how artists work in the commercial space, how contracts work, what the language is like, what the sell is like. And then also I'm in a vacuum of all of these artists in the community now, seeing how they do their work and then just being a sponge, man. And yeah. so like in this whole time that I'm building a professional skill set, I'm also building up my passion and like hanging out with people that I once followed and like and just seeing how they move and learning, yeah, just learning everything that I could. And yeah, yeah. it's kind of was a really nice net to fall into. Yeah, I, I think the most successful people are the ones who identify the right opportunities and pounce on them when they're there. Mm -hmm. You know, they know that like this isn't something to wait. Not usually is it very next day like that, but that's badass that you chose to do that. It and obviously wild. it was a, a good decision and got you to a good place. Yeah, I, my last job, I won't tell the whole story because I've told it too many times, but I worked at Verizon, it was sales. I was really good at it. And it just sucked my soul out of my yep. body. I just couldn't do it. but. It, those same skill sets are what worked for me to open my skateboard shop because mm -hmm. I understand how I knew how to sell myself as the solution to people sell mm -hmm. my store as the solution you know mm -hmm. I knew how to build a clientele like that I knew what it took to actually give go good customer service I understood how to like make a plan and follow through it all those stuff all those things really translated which then translated to art and my show like it, right. it all has worked that way part of the reason that my art has worked as well as it has I think is just because I understand the business side of it as mm -hmm. well as I do. Oh you yeah, know? it's a big part. Oh yeah, it's a huge part of it. Mm -hmm. And most artists aren't good at that, no. unfortunately. So you're doing really well at it and your art has been taking off, but I wanna know now like kind of where you're at along the path, what you're currently doing, like what, cause you're still working with that company, uh -huh. but kind of like what are you currently working on and doing and where are you headed? Yeah, so fast forward from the story of me getting hired, yeah. um, I now own and operate the company that I got hired to work wow. for. I'm a third cool. owner now, so yeah. it's like that's progressed to me just like, yeah, kind of taking charge of all operations, all sales and project management and doing it well enough that once one was wanting to step away, it was an easy, natural progression for me to step in that seat. Yeah. So now, yeah, I'm kind of in that seat, running the helm there. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, and we, we're 10, 10 years open now. Uh, yeah, so right now I'm kind of getting ready for the South by stuff. We do like a lot of activations for the brands that come into town. So whether it be branding, live painting, uh, we, we also do like fabrication work. So if they want, you know, a faux wall to go up with vinyl installations, all that, like we do all of those things. So yeah. kind of like basically my day to day is pretty much that uh, aside from the company. I'm um, yeah, actually building up for my first solo show uh, June 3rd here in Austin. And that's to me is a trip because out of all of the years that I've been painting since 2012 at the, you know, in 2012, I say like when I'm actually starting to really be intentional about what I'm painting, right. um, this is the year that I finally feel ready to actually put my work out there. 11 uh, years later. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And yeah. you know, it's, it's trippy, but I've just never felt good about, not that I've never felt good about my art. It's just, I just knew like, I don't know. It just never really felt right and um i mean it's hard when you're representing and helping all of these really incredible artists get yeah. all of these jobs i'm sure it mm -hmm. affects your own insecurities and whatnot to see all these successful people that are crushing oh, and go, sure. oh well, okay well if they're doing this i know i can get better maybe i need to right but i mean murals and stuff that doesn't like i love to get you know i mean i put people in front of me all the time because like some of those opportunities i just it's cool and it's good money and like it's dope but like I want to be. I want to take my art into the fine art space somehow. Yeah. I don't know if that's the right verbiage. Like I'm just so, I'm just like creating, and I want to create. Like I guess what I've been building on is like my characters are all have always. My art has always kind of been in that same space. Like this is chapter one for me. The past eleven years is chapter one. Yeah. And I'm at the closing part of chapter one. I feel like because most of my work has been shown on Instagram. Cool. You've seen my work on Instagram primarily, yeah. but when you stand in front of these pieces in person, it's a completely different game. Yeah. Right. And then I'm trying to also, I just want one, the respect from my peers. That's the most important to me. Like I want my friends to be like, damn, you know, yeah. like this dude, like coming into a room and seeing like, cause most people have seen one piece, two piece 
in a show that I'm like a part of a group show or, right. you know, they see me working on it in the studio and they happen to come by. Uh, but the majority of people, again, have never stood in front of my work unless they bought. Right. So like this come into a room and be fully submerged in my work top to bottom, but have the experience, you know, I'm going to have live screen printers. I'm going to have just crazy food that I want to like bring weird things to the table. Like kind of like, gourmet the cheap shit you know yeah, <laughs> like i yeah. want a corn dog that you've never seen before that's just like gonna blow your mind and you'd be like what is going on with like i like you to think that it might be so simple yet it's there's so many so much deeper than what it might come across from the surface yeah but yeah but anyways yeah so i'm building up for that starting last month about how many pieces is your goal for that i want to paint as much as i can until the show so if i have to remove pieces from the show great uh, but I want so I want to paint my head down until June third. Wow. There's no end goal for sure. me. Sure. So like I'm right now I'm have about 15 canvases in the house now. Um, so I would like to paint those. Um, I have a friend of mine helping me out with CNC and some cutouts. Where I'll have 20 different cutouts doing that and then custom painting all of those. Like just trying to really make it a well-rounded show rather than just seeing canvases. Right. You'll see cutouts. You'll see framed paper. You'll see uh, there'll be a shop where you can buy shirts, prints, like there'll be sure. another room. So like, I'm really trying to like hit the ground and being like, I'm here finally, yeah. even though most of my friends of, you know, and people in the city, I, you know, kind of gained a little bit of a reputation here. Um, that it's just nice. Cause no one's, I don't know. It's just you, like, it's overdue. Everyone's like, you have not sh- have a show. I'm like, no. And they're like, what? Yeah. Like everyone just trips out on it. Do I'm you feel like, stress on what the expectations are or is it more just exciting? It's, it's a, it's a mixed bag, man. Yeah. Cause like, yes, like what is scary is that this is the first time, you know, it's the, the life of an artist, right? It's the core of what we are is you're putting yourself out there to be accepted or rejected. Yes. You can say, fuck what everybody thinks about you, but at the end of the day, you still want to be able to call it a success. Right. And whatever success means to you on that front, is it, you know, hitting a certain number to maybe get some return. Cause you know, that's also a thing for myself that it is one of my revenue streams, a piece of it. Um, so when I have to close that faucet to build the work, you know, it adds a little more pressure to every, you know, the other things I have going on, you know? So it's, it's kind of like the life game playing the life game and trying to make it work financially so that you're not in a tough position or having to, to, you know, stress out too much in that front, but so yeah, you're not selling anything until the show then zero. So are I you even going to, are you going to post any of it or is no, it all just, it's, no, I'm going to try wow. to come up with yeah. some content to keep things going, yeah. but I still haven't got to that point. I'm trying to wow. just like start th- right. the first two months with just like getting paintings down. Yeah. And then once the marketing and stuff and all that stuff comes out, cause I'm working with my friends, almost real things, rad people here in the city. Um, Zach and Natalie are just incredible beautiful people that started a magazine that's centered around art here in the city, a free magazine. And they have just started when I pretty much moved here, they were just starting their magazine and we both kind of come up together over the years and they have a beautiful space and they throw just incredible events. I mean, and they have this event coming up like the hundred dollar show where you have some of the bigger artists in the city that are having pieces for a hundred bucks, you know, and that's little things like that. I'm poking my nose in so that I could generate revenue to put back into the show. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I, I mean, I, that's just, it's so much to build up for. And I think most people don't have the patience for that kind of thing. You know, so people lot. like to hide behind a screen because they can turn it off. You know, if it if it's getting overwhelming, right. you know, posting your stuff or whatever, it's, it's already like scary just to post something publicly that right. you do, but to like curate an entire event and put six months or more of your life into something is, is sure. a lot. But at the same time, doing something like that, that's what is going to bring the really, really high moments, yeah. right? Of like this oh, yeah. build up, nothing's going to feel quite like that. So along those lines, I think when you do things that you're really passionate about for a living, such as like helping other artists find their, mm-hmm. you know, get their name, get their job, selling your own art, being a part of this really cool community, you get to have really unique experiences sure. that are really valuable and meaningful to for you. Sure. Usually they're not financially related in any kind of way. Zero. What's a story of an experience that you're really grateful for, but it only happened because you pursued art? Man. Um, experience i mean i'm grateful for my my friends that i've met here like the community our community here has been i mean i cannot say enough about it like everybody is so welcoming here it's it's bananas and i mean and the, the first the, the experience that comes to my mind you know kind of segueing off that community is my buddy matt 
uh, Trujillo, who's an incredible artist here in the city from New Mexico. Um, he's represented by Wells Chelsea here in town, and they had a show in New York. And this is kind of the story that you know took me to LA kind of in the same way um, and how we met. But yeah, he was like, man, I have, he's here on my couch, and we're just like talking shit watching the cowboy game yeah. he's like man i'm having a piece hanging in the show and he's hanging next to like a banksy's and you know wow. and brisk and you know like he's on the wall with this which for us you know it's one of us you know we all came in moved yeah. here together trying to build we made yeah, it yeah like all yeah. of us are trying to build our names up in our own way we all have our own styles all in the same space not competing but sharing resources like using each other as almost like fucking therapy man it's church like we were able to talk out our insecurities our like art our life like without with immediate feedback from our peers and as well as a comfortable place for us like especially men to be able to talk about like mental health and like you know all of those things because he's also one that helped me kind of get into therapy and like for no reason just because he was talking about it and i was like oh damn like you know so like it, it right. goes further than just these experiences it goes far deeper but um but yeah he was sitting on my couch man and uh he was like yeah i'm, I'm showing and you know they're having me at my pieces in west chelsea like in, in the manhattan gallery or wherever the they can, it's called West Chelsea in West Chelsea, um, and I was like, really? And he's like, yeah. I was like, shut the. I was like, you know, like yeah, prove it. Didn't believe it. Yeah. And he showed me, and I was like, I'll buy my plane ticket right now. And then I bought my plane ticket, as did my buddy Jeff Skelly, and then as did my buddy Gabriel Portillo Paste, and then we all flew to you know New York to watch my buddy paint. None of us are there, but Matt. You know, he's the only right. one in the show. He sold the, one of the first pieces of the night. And I mean, we were just like, you know, like we all were just crazy high. I mean, going yeah. nuts in that gallery. Everyone knew who we were from Austin. Like, no, nope, we, we weren't trying to spread our art. We were right. just like Matt True and everybody's here. You know, like we were riding a high that had nothing to do with any of us individuals, but Matt. Right. And we were just like on top of the world. And like that experience, we were there for four days and just like rode this fucking wave and yeah i mean that right there like sums up like if i didn't pursue art i never would have met guys like this like and there's one girl as well christine so i don't want to just like leave her out but it's like just having people that are like see you in a space that really i feels like none of my other friends have really have known me in this space i guess yeah. they know me but from afar right like right. even your best friends from growing up if they're in a different state they knew you in that time they were shoulder to shoulder with you right but as distance goes like yeah you can talk on the phone all you want but without really being around each other for the day to day there's a certain piece missing of that connection right right and even negative or positive either way sure, it's not yeah. like bad but i'm just saying these are the guys that are seeing you every day hearing you every day watching you grow every day yet they're supporting your wins as if they just won and got their bank account yeah you know, i mean being in the trenches with you through all that it's it's like people think that being an artist or being self-employed or whatever is really lonely. And I, I don't think it is. Cause if you do something that you care about, all the other people around you are kind of like your coworkers and on your team. For really? sure. They're yeah. all part of, you're all on the same team together. Yeah. If one of you succeeds, guess what happens? You fly out to New York, you meet someone now here, you're having an art show or yeah. being a part of an art show in LA with it. So it's like everyone does win together, not necessarily intentionally. It's not like that was like what you were, planning on by that happening no. but it just happens naturally because right. of that which is so awesome you don't right. have to like be strategic you can just be, be yourself with people yeah, yeah and that's literally this the girl that was also out there that he's friends with uh, ashley metro she's the one who at new york told me about the show in la yeah and then i applied for the la show we all did i'm the only one that got chosen for whatever reason so when i flew out there matt said i'll join you and then yeah i meet you and you're here so it's like yeah all of that happened just because i took the jump to move here in 2017 you know it's like yeah but it's like also yeah you look back at my life and i'm just like man i just had the ability to leave work which i have a lot more freedom to like kind of be flexible with my schedule yeah and just go do crazy stuff and just like be supportive and then it all kind of comes back around yeah in some crazy way so yeah dude it's thank you so much for having me this has been really really awesome to be like to see and i'm excited for you to tell me now off mic about all this stuff it's cool that you're now in a position where you can not only like work on your own like 
solo show mm-hmm. and really get where you want to be or hopefully get your foot in the fine art world in the way that you're intending but being able to be in a position where you saw what an art community did for you personally you oh, know, yeah. mental health wise and career wise and now you're in a place of being able to kind of curate and help other people yep. get into that space too that's kind of sure. like that next next level of it and it's awesome to see that you accept that responsibility oh, in yeah. a positive way because i feel like i do that within the skateboarding community to a certain right. degree it's like being able to be in that role the the effect that you're going to have on other people on their lives on their career on on, just on them in general you're going to have such a profound impact on them without even knowing it because of what you're choosing to put all of your time and energy into how can people best support you moving forward how can they come and see obviously like you said in june that you know they could fly out to austin but there's yeah. listeners for the show kind of all over the country <laughs> a lot in wisconsin so they right. may not get here oh it's all you good. know plug your instagram or whatever how can people support you and see your work yeah instagram would be the mainstay um that's erk underscore ross yeah erk ross that is the uh that is the instagram that's the place to find me reach out if you have any questions you know like with the job that i do have you know like all of my friends here in the community, you know, they reach out to me when they have their own jobs, just as for input and resources on like, how do I approach this job? How do I approach, approach pricing? How do I approach contracts? All of that. Anyone out there that needs help with any of those kind of resources, I'm an open book and love to share all that stuff. So if you want to hit me on the DMs, always down to help with that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm reachable. So just hit me up. Dope. Thanks again, man. Thank you for joining us for this episode of The Passion Pod. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. We'll see you soon.